My name is Sari Delamont. I'm the CEO and founder of Forte, a communications consulting firm in Portland, Oregon. We believe that if you change your communication, you can change your life. In this video, we're going to show you how to grow your presence by looking at the four components of presence, mind, body, space, and others, both here in our studio in Portland and with a live seminar audience. We're going to start with how we always start here at Forte by looking at nonverbal intelligence and how it is connected to presence. Here's how we define nonverbal intelligence. Your ability to be aware both of your nonverbal communication and other people's nonverbal communication. Then based on what you're observing, the ability to adapt your communication to fit the needs of the situation, all while remaining authentic authentic because that's a huge piece of this. We don't want you to be doing things to manipulate people. Although we do say that some of these things aren't going to be comfortable at first, that doesn't mean they're inauthentic. But we do want them to remain as authentic to you as possible. Nonverbal intelligence and presence are intimately connected. But before we define what we mean by presence, let's take a look at what presence is not. I'm going to say that presence is not charisma. Charisma. There, there, there is this, this, this word charisma, and we used to use it a lot at Forte, but what I started to realize is that there really are some people who are just born with charisma. Some really creepy people <laughs> are born with, no, I joke. I mean, but really, sometimes like, those two things go together, wouldn't you say? Because charisma in, its, in itself is this kind of, you can't say no to me kind of thing. And that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about presence. Here at Forte, we say that presence is your nonverbal persona. It's how you show up nonverbally. Therefore, everybody has presence. The question is, is it the presence that you want? Is it the presence that you want? Does it make people stand up and pay attention when you walk into a room? So we're going to look today at how do you increase your nonverbal persona or your presence, and we're going to do that by looking at four components of presence that we've identified here. Mind, body, space, and others. So today we're going to start with mind. We tend to make up stories about what's happening with what we see around us, and then we communicate based on those stories, and then we get into all sorts of trouble. So stories are the first thing we have to dismantle if we want to have presence, because presence starts with the mind. So why are stories so problematic? Well, because body language starts in the brain. If we hold a story up in our brain, it will get communicated non-verbally. For example, as many of you know, I work with a lot of attorneys, and I work with them on jury selection. A big story that a lot of attorneys hold is that conservative jurors can't be trusted. And so this is a story I dismantle quite often with my attorney clients, because I say to them, if you go into the jury selection process holding the story that you cannot trust conservative jurors, you will communicate that non-verbally. And yet, as an attorney, what are you asking the jurors to do? you're asking them to trust you. Now, why would any juror trust you when right out of the gate, you're already non-verbally communicating that you don't trust them? Not to mention that stories take you out of the present moment, which is where you have the most power. If we really want to be present, we have to first clear our mind and communicate based on reality, which is what's happening right in front of us. Now the number one way to communicate in reality and get out of our heads is breathing. Breathing brings you into the present moment immediately. If you can't breathe well under pressure, you will never be a rock star communicator because breathing gets communicated. Breathing gets communicated in that the listener 
starts to pick up our breathing cues. So not only are they aware that we're not breathing well, even though they can't formulate that in their mind, oh, this person isn't breathing well, they start to pick up on your breathing cues. So if you're not breathing well, and you're breathing high, and you're in this kind of fight or flight place, they will start to become in that fight or flight place. So it's so important for you as a communicator to be able to access your breath in the moment. Breathing is the vehicle for presence. Because you can't have presence in the past and you can't have presence in the future. Presence happens right now. And breathing is the number one way to get you into the present moment. Now, when can we breathe, particularly when we're presenting information? During the pause. And yet, the pause has an extra benefit as it's the number one confidence nonverbal. Breathing happens when we pause. And the pause is the number one confidence nonverbal. Because you know what the pause does when you are pausing? What you're saying to your audience is, you will wait for me. That's what the pause does. We're going to talk about gesturing and how that helps in just a minute. But so often people don't pause. So they talk really quickly and there's no pausing. And then when they don't pause, they don't breathe. So that's all uh, another problem. But nonverbally, what message are you getting when I'm not pausing right now? The message you should be getting is, what I have to say isn't very important, so let me just quickly get it in so you don't have to listen to me for very long. But when you put in pausing, that puts in this idea that this is important information. And it also allows you to breathe. Gesturing is going to help here. Because not only are we talking about up palms and down palms, we're talking about what to do with the hands in between. Because a lot of you, I saw you do this, you do something like this. This is your agenda for today. Do you see what I did there? This is your agenda for today. I dropped the, the palms. This is not appropriate gesturing when you do this. But a lot of you do this. Because <laughs> we don't know what to do with our hands. Some of you won't go all the way down. You'll do this. So you'll gesture. And we call this the belly button checker. Because you're, you're afraid that during the pause, your belly button might have gone missing. <laughs> so you bring it here. Or my favorite, which is the T-Rex gesturing, you know, where they hit here and it's just, you know, <laughs> from here. This is your agenda for today. What would you like me to do? Now notice how I hold the attention of the entire room by freezing the hand when I pause. Because just pausing is awkward without gestures, right? Isn't this weird? <laughs> but pausing is not awkward with gestures. Notice how I haven't changed how long that pause is, but suddenly it's so much better. So let's try this one more time. And this time I want you to keep those hands in the air. So not this is your agenda for today, or this is your agenda for today, or this is your agenda for today. Um, <laughs> this is your agenda for today. Pause. Now don't drop them. You can turn them up now and go, what would you like me to do? All right, let's look at the second one, which is body. So once you get your mind clear and present and here, and you get rid of your stories, you get rid of your, your, the stuff, the scatterbrain, you're, you're present, you're breathing. Now the, the question is, what is going on with my body language? Most people are not aware. How many of you have ever been videotaped? It's horrifying, is it not? So we have two basic sets of nonverbals. Those of you who are here last year will remember this. The first set is the authoritative, what we call the authoritative nonverbal. So this is where the weight is evenly distributed over both legs, so how I'm standing now. If uh, the toes are pointed forward, if gesturing, maybe I'm going ahead of myself, the palms are facing down, and the head is still. So this is your basic authoritative body language, which some of you use naturally. This is just your natural. I'm from Finland, and my, both my parents are immigrants. I'm first born here. And authoritative body language is just the norm. I don't know if it's the cold or the vodka drinking or what it is. But um, it's the authoritative body language and voice pattern. 
On the flip side, we have the approachable nonverbals, where the weight is unevenly distributed, so over one leg. The toes are not necessarily pointed forward. The head bobs up and down or tilts to the side, and the palms face up. So even when I talk about this in terms of the United States, where would you tend to see more authoritative nonverbals in the United States? What part of the United States? East Coast. East Coast. How about approachable? South. South. Yeah. What about West Coast? What would that be? In between. In between. It depends. Yeah, so immediately you know where these are. But we, all, we start making up stories about this body language too, don't we? We're going to get there when we get to others. We get, when we get to others. So along with the body language, we also have the voice pattern to match. So because of that head is still an authoritative body language, that creates a very flat sounding voice that curls down. And I tend to, to call this the James Bond voice pattern. Bond. James Bond. Let's try that. Turn to your neighbor. Here we go. <laughs> Bond. James Bond. Yes. Tip the chin down. It's, for me, it's between Connery and Daniel Craig. I, you know, I don't know. They're both really good. Um, okay, so that's our authoritative voice pattern. That's the voice pattern that you'll hear with the authority. The approachal voice pattern, on the other hand, because of that bobbing head, the voice tends to be more rhythmic, like this, and tends to curl up at the ends of statements. And the way to remember this is to think of our friend, our neighbor, Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my neighbor? Let's turn, start bobbing your head. Here we go. Won't you be my neighbor? There it is. That's the approach of the voice pattern. Now, if you want presence, okay, so first we have to get here. We have to actually be present. So we get rid of our stories and our scattered thinking. We get into our body, and now we're aware, because you can't be aware of your body language if you're not here. So that's the first reason why we talk about stories, is you've got to get rid of that so you can actually know how you're communicating. Most people, as you noticed when you did the, the little thing you just did a minute ago, have absolutely no idea how they're communicating non-verbally. And you can't have any idea until you actually get into your body, which is what breathing does for you. But once you're there, now we can start labeling the things that you're doing. So that's the first piece is, are you using approachable? Are you using authority, authoritative? But the next piece is, when is each appropriate? So let's take a look at this. So we just picked the, this content. Doesn't matter what your content is. But this is your agenda for today. What do you need me to do? Which one of these should be said authoritatively and which one should be said approachably? So first one, authoritative. And the second one, approachable. So this is your agenda for today. Notice how body language is authoritative, palm down, voice is flat and curls down. What do you need me to do? would be approachable. Here's the general rule of thumb. You want to use authoritative body language when you are sending information and approachable body language when you are seeking information. And yet we reverse this all the time, don't we? When I first started, in, I started teaching teachers about nonverbal communication in the classroom. And one of the things we would find teachers would do would be something like this when they're trying to get their class started. Class, class, I need your attention. Class, come on, come on, class, class. Right? And the class would not come to attention. Then once they finally got the class settled down, they would say, so, who did the reading last night? Nobody? Nobody did the reading. And they would come up to me afterwards, they go, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I can't get my class settled. And then once I do get them settled, they won't talk to me. And I said, well, you're reversing this, this rule. It's when you want your class to come to attention, you need to be authoritative. Class, let's get started. Who did the reading last night? It's the same in the legal world now that I work in. So when they're in the voir dire jury selection process, they say, you do understand that it's not always appropriate for the police to use force, right? And the juror's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm there going, that's not actually a question. That's a statement that you're asking them to agree with. You've got to reverse that. You've got to reverse that. So if we're seeking information, we want to be approachable and ask people to engage with us 
And when we are sending information, we want to make sure that we are authoritative so that we're saying this is one-way communication. This is important. And yet, oftentimes, we tend to do the opposite, especially when we're giving bad news. We go, well, see, we can't do that. Because, you know, right? And we do the approachable. And then, they, and then we say, now, can't answer any questions. And we're non-verbally communicating. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna answer any questions. When we should say, we're not going to be able to discuss that today, or that bill won't be passed, or the budget is not going to work, whatever the situation is, what questions may I answer? What story do we make up about people who use authoritative body language? Bossy, bully, mean, impatient, no, no at all. Mm -hmm. What story do we make up about approach people who use approachable body language and voice pattern? Nice, friend, come, what are some negative things? They don't know much. Wishy-washy, weak, that's the word I was hearing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we make up stories, but here's the point, is that if you wanna be a rock star communicator you, and you wanna have presence, you have to have both. You have to have both. When we're talking about leadership, for example, leadership is both of these things. Because when we're looking to a leader, we wanna know that one, they can do what they say they're gonna do. That is communicated authoritatively. But two, we also want a leader who we think cares. That's communicated through approachability. I mean, if we're talking about presence, or if you wanna use the word charisma, it's when you blend these two things, when people can be both, because we all know people who are all authoritative all the time, and they are bossy, bully, not approachable. And we know people who are approachable all the time, and we think, well, they're certainly nice, but I don't know that I would trust them with this project. It's when you can put the two together that that's really where things come together. Last year, I told a story about when my dad had a stroke in 2010, and we were in the hospital room, and we were watching the nurses, and we started picking out our favorites. And some of the nurses were highly authoritative, and so they definitely knew what they were doing, but they were all business. And some of the nurses were highly approachable. And they were all about my dad making jokes, but you know, they're not looking where they're, they're putting the needle in and we're like, ah, you know. It, the best nurses were a combination of the two. When we, they knew what they were doing and they also cared about my dad. And that is true of any profession. The best lawyers, the best educators, the best legislators, the best staff is when you have the combination of authoritative and approachable. So be careful about making up stories about what this body language means, because that's what gets you in trouble. You need to be able to do both. Let's come back to breathing for a minute, though. Breathing has a huge impact here. If I am using the authoritative body language and voice pattern and I'm not breathing well, this is your agenda for today. That obviously is not what we want. Same thing goes with the approachable. What do you need me to do? I'm not breathing when I'm saying that, <laughs> right? So there's a difference. If I say, this is your agenda today, and I'm breathing well, I just sound definitive. What do you need me to do? Open and friendly. It comes down to breathing. What is tone? Tone is voice pattern plus breathing. That's what tone is. So when you have one of these voice patterns and you're breathing well, then you're communicating what we want to communicate. It's when you start to not breathe well. That's why breathing is so important in this work. You start to convey messages that you may not want to convey. Not only do you have to be present in your mind, get rid of the stories, you have to be present in terms of how am I using my body so that I can communicate presence out into the room. But now that you actually are aware of your body and your body language, now you have to send it out and you have to be aware of the space that you're in. Most people are only communicating to the ends of their fingertips, if even that. Meaning when you communicate, you are, if you're even aware of your body, that's all you're aware. You're not aware of the space that you are in. And space is huge in terms of presence because you can't have presence by yourself. It has to involve other people. You know, I was talking about space, and Rachel and I, Rachel is a trainer at Forte, we're talking about this concept, and it's a nebulous concept because you can't really see space. Meaning, we tend to think of space as walls, but we're talking about beyond the walls. 
And so Rachel and I were sitting in my uh, office one day talking about this concept of presence and space, and she said, I wonder if you can tell how much space I'm aware of. I said, well, let's try it. So I was sitting behind my desk, and she was in front of me. And so I, she said, I'm going to close my eyes, and when I open my eyes, I'm just going to take in some, you know, I'm going to be aware of a certain amount of space. You tell me what you see. So she closed her eyes, she opened her eyes, and I said, you're aware of the space directly in front of you, just right up to my desk. And she said, yes. She said, let me try it again. So she closed her eyes, and this time when she opened her eyes, I, she didn't look up, but I felt the energy, the whatever it was, just shoot up from the top of her head. And I said, oh my word, you just went up. And she said, yeah, I'm thinking of your apartment, because our office at that time is at the bottom of a high rise, and we lived on the top, in the 25th floor. She goes, I was thinking all the way up of your, uh, your apartment on the top floor. Now, how I could tell that she was aware of space, 25 floors of space, I can't tell you. I just know that I was aware. And I know that you are aware as well. There is a really fantastic um, keynote speaker. He has no arms and no legs. This man takes up so much space on the stage when you watch him speak. He's amazing. This has nothing to do with size. This has to do with how much space you are aware of and how much space you are thinking about. For example, when I was talking about this at City of Beaverton, we went and we did a training there on presentation skills, and we always talk about space because as a presenter, you have to be aware of the space that you're in. When I was here this morning, or this afternoon, before you all started filing in, I was standing here and all I was doing was taking in the space, making sure that all of this was in my awareness. So a woman came up to me at the training and she said, it's so funny that you talk about this idea of space because I'm a professional ballroom dancer in my spare time. I said, really? That's fascinating. And she said, and yes, and nobody's ever called it what you're calling it, but what I think you're talking about is what my instructor says when I'm dancing with my partner. I said, what does your instructor say? She said, that they say that you always, even though you are looking at your partner, you know, we're making eye contact, you must always keep the audience in your awareness or there's no reason that they would continue to watch you dance. It's just a private thing between me and my partner unless they are in my awareness. And she goes, and the audience can tell when they're in our awareness. Even though if I'm not looking at the audience, if I'm not thinking about them or having them in my awareness, they feel left out. It's so true. When I train people how to give testimony on the stand, I say, you're going to be testifying and the attorney is going to be standing there and you are technically giving your answers to the attorney, but the people you're really talking to is the jury. Even though you're not looking at the jury, you need to hold them in your awareness or they are going to feel left out, like it's a private conversation. So oftentimes I'll have the attorney come and take my space, my place, and talk with the person one-on-one, -on -one, and I will go and I'll stand in the jury box and I'll just say, just keep your awareness, don't look at me, but just know where I am at all times and I'll move around so that that, that box kind of stays in their awareness. This idea of space is so huge in terms of presence. If you want to grow your presence, you can't just have it be about you and your body in here. It's got to go out. Here's what we're going to say. If you want to grow your presence, you have to be big. A big part of that is claiming space, what we say, claiming space. Now, when I talk about claiming space, I don't mean this space is mine and people aren't going to get into it. I, I think of it more like a nonverbal picnic blanket that you put out and you go, I have arrived and I'm inviting you to also arrive. When we see someone with presence, this is what we're seeing. People who walk in a room with a big presence aren't in their heads. They're not just aware of themselves. They are sending it out. They have a sense of the space in which they are communicating in, and they are present in that space. So here's what we're going to say in terms of how to claim space. First thing is to ground yourself. You can walk and, and still claim space, but when you're first playing around with this, ground yourself, be still, and become aware of the space you want to claim. So when I started here this afternoon before you all came in, I was standing here and I was taking in the whole room because I don't want to, the gentleman in the back corner in the blue shirt to feel like he's not a part of this, right? Or the, uh, blue shirts on both corners, how fun. All right, I, I wanted everyone to feel like they were part of this seminar today. So I started claiming this whole room. You may not want to claim the whole room. And in fact, when we're talking to attorneys, uh, sometimes I say you only want to claim sometimes the jury box and you and leave everybody else out. So it feels a little bit more intimate. But you want to claim space. So be aware of the uh, space you wish to claim. Breathe into the space. It's not going to help if you're holding your breath. 
And take in the space with your eyes. But as we mentioned with the ballroom dancer or the person on the stand, it's not always about eye contact, but that helps to take in the space with your eyes. And actively decide to send your presence outward. That's a big part of this, is a lot of times you don't have presence or big presence because you don't want to. You, it's too vulnerable to actually put it out there. So you actually have to make the decision that you want to invite others to partake with you, to be present with you. And again, use gestures and pausing that are big enough for the space. We talk a lot about gesturing in our presentation skills training. So when I'm up here on stage with the hundreds of people that are in the room today, look how big my gestures are. Now, when I train presenters and I, I say, okay, let's see your gesturing, they're like here. And I say, no, you have to be out here for the, the group you're gonna speak to. And they go, to them, that feels like this. All right. Now, when I was, you know, at Habitat for Humanity asked me to, to MC one of their events and there was a thousand people in the room, I almost had to be out here, right, because it was a huge room. But this is awkward for most people because we don't tend to use these big gestures in real life, do we? When we go to coffee, we're sitting with someone, we're doing this kind of thing. But that doesn't work. You can't translate those gestures to a big stage and still have this be work. Do you see how small I look? up here. So you have to have big enough gestures for the space that you're working in. So depending on how big the space is, your gestures are going to adapt for that, for that space. All right, let's end with others. If you're not aware of what you're thinking or what you're communicating with your body or the space that you're communicating in, you cannot be aware of others. That's the end. You can't start there. You have to start with, all, with yourself first. But if you've done all these three things and now you want to engage with other people, here's how we're gonna tell you in terms of others. Most of us are not aware of other people and their communication and we make up stories. That's where we go wrong. So the communication tip here is to be adaptable. So here's the rules of engagement. There's two basic areas in which people want to engage with you. Very simple. They either want to engage with you on a relationship level or they want to engage with you on an issue level. Almost every communication situation fits into one of these two buckets. So it's either we're just having a, a discussion and we're just talking about our summer vacation or we're talking about something legislative or we're talking about the budget or we're talking about something issue oriented. Now, if you can pick up on this and give people what they want, that's where your nonverbal permission goes up because we tend to get in trouble when we misread these signs. We want to go to relationship, but someone else wants to talk about the issue and we mismatch. So you heard me use the word permission and I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we mean by that word. What we don't mean is verbal permission. You know, when you ask someone, hey, do I have your permission to do such and such? What we're talking about is nonverbal permission, which we tend to think is invisible. But if we know what to look for nonverbally, it really isn't. If we know what to watch for and we can adapt our nonverbal behavior, permission with others goes up. And the way that we define permission is how receptive someone is to us or our message. Here's the general rule of thumb. When you see approachable body language, you be approachable yourself and go to the relationship. When you see authoritative body language, you need to be authoritative and go to the issue. But oftentimes we mismatch. So people often say, well, how do you start a meeting? How do, you know, should I get right to the issue or should I do some small talk? I say it depends on the person you're with. If the person walks into the meeting and they're like, hi, how are you? And they're giving you lots of eye contact and the palms are up and the head is bobbing, and you say, thank you for coming, let's talk about the budget. You've missed your opportunity. But if on the other hand, the person comes in, they're not looking at you, uh, yeah, do you want me to sit here? And you go, yeah, but you know, before we get to business, let's talk, how are things going in your department? You lost it again. It's not that one is right or one is wrong, it's what do people want, and when you give it to them, permission goes up. Man, this is the trick in terms of communicating. This isn't manipulative. This is just speaking someone else's language and reading what they want and giving it to them. All right, so let's make sure that it's clear what we mean by when you see approachable, be approachable, and when you see authoritative, be authoritative. If you notice someone using approachable body language, you'll see them either leaning forward or leaning back. They tend to have up palms and either have their head tilted or nodding. 
If you see this body language, what that's communicating most of the time, not every time, is that this person wants to go to the relationship. So not only will you go to the relationship, you'll match body language by also leaning forward, also having palms turned up, also tilting the head. Now on the flip side, if you see authoritative body language, that might look something like this, where the person is sitting straight up. Their arms might be crossed. The feet will be flat on the floor. They may lean back. When you see that body language, what that's telling you is that this person, again, not in every case, but in most cases, wants you to get to the issue. So not only should you go to the issue, you should match body language by being authoritative yourself. I wouldn't necessarily cross my arms, but I would definitely have the more stiff posture, straight, and palms down. Use that authoritative voice pattern as well. Folks, this is presence. These are the people that you see is that they're present, they're with you, they're here, they know how they're communicating, they're aware of the space, and they can handle anybody. You just look at them and go, wow, no matter who they're talking to, they can handle it. That's because they're adaptable. They don't have one way of communicating. Go, this is how I, I always like to start with small talk, and that's just how I work. Well, goody for you. But if you want to be a rock star communicator, you will watch the other person and adapt. Because here's the thing, we are all authoritative somewhere in our lives, and we are all approachable somewhere in our lives. No, I've never met anyone who was completely one or the other. It's all about timing. It's all about timing and watching the people that you're with so that you can adapt, because that's what we're talking about. So be powerful is the last thing that we're gonna leave you with in terms of if you are a rock star communicator and now you've got presence, the next place really to take it is leadership presence. Leadership presence is really the next level. And a lot of times when I talk to people, particularly people who are not in leadership positions, they tend to have this idea of the have, do, be model. They go, well, if I could just have a following, a leadership position, some real responsibility, then I could do things like create change, win a trial, get people on board, which would allow me to be a real leader. And what we're suggesting here at Forte is that you turn that around. Be a leader, make the decision to lead, and then do the things a leader does, and then you'll have the things that you want. Because leadership is really, this is how we define leadership at Forte, it's really this simple. You have to be going somewhere, and you have to have followers. If you have those two things, you're a leader. You could be a crappy leader, but at least those two things you have to have, right? I mean, would you agree? You could be going somewhere, but if nobody's following you, you're not a leader, right? And if you're not going anywhere, there's no reason for people to follow you. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's a LA PD officer, he said, this is an interesting concept. He said, it's, it's kind of like if you have a group following you, you're a leader. If you have one person following you, you have a stalker. <laughs> I said, yeah, we probably want more than one person. So the first part of this takes a decision. It's just deciding to lead. But the second piece takes presence. It takes presence to have, to have people follow you. If you're waiting for permission to lead, that's never going to happen. You've got to make the decision. But you have to have, once you make that decision, you have to have presence. You have to be here in your mind. You have to be aware of what you're communicating non-verbally. You have to send it out into the space that you're communicating in. And you have to be aware of what comes back in terms of the people you're communicating with. When you're able to do that, then you will have presence. If you want more information, we do have a leadership clinic, an online leadership clinic. We only take 12 people at one time. It runs several times over the year. You can visit our website at www.nonverbalforte.com to learn about our leadership clinic and how to increase now your leadership presence. But until we meet again, I invite you to be bold, be real, and be a communication rock star.